Dr. Miriam Huntley. So Dr. Huntley is the Chief Technology Officer and a co-founder at Day Zero Diagnostics. As the CTO, Dr. Huntley leads the company in technolo technological development, particularly in the areas of R&D, related to machine learning, software development, and genomic sequencing. She's been recognized for her work at Day Zero Diagnostics through awards such as MedTech Boston's 40 Under 40 and as a TED Med Hive Innovator. Dr. Huntley earned her bachelor's from MIT in physics and her PhD in applied math at Harvard, where she was an NSF GRFP fellow. For her PhD, she developed data analysis methods and theoretical models for problems in biology, particularly focusing on analyzing large genomic data sets. Her graduate work uncovered fundamental structures in the three-dimensional folded genome and has been covered widely in media outlets such as NPR and Forbes and exhibited at the Smithsonian Museum. Thank you for being here. I can also just go without slides, but <laughs> I think the slides are more interesting. Thank you, Heather, uh, for the invitation, and I'm so delighted and honored to be here at this uh, inaugural, inaugural WIDS Boston event um, and tell you a little bit about something that I really love, which is data science in genomics. So I'm going to start off with a, a little bit of a controversial statement, which is today, April 5th, 2019, is the best day in all of history for genomic data science. There is no better day uh, looking backwards. And that's a little controversial. Because you might say, well, actually, June 27, 2000 was probably the most exciting day in genomic data science because that was the day that we finally sequenced the human genome. We'd mapped out everything from, uh, you know, chromosome 1 to chromosome Y, finally understood what made up our DNA. Um, but, you know, while this was heralded as an advance in science and it was going to bring out a new era of, of science and of medicine, um, you know, in 2000s, there was a handful of people who had their genome sequenced. And uh, since then, we've had a lot of amazing technological advancements which really changed data science. So the cost of sequencing a human genome in the early 2000s uh, was in the billions. Because of new technological advancements, that cost has been dropping. If you haven't seen this plot before, it should really shock you. The cost of sequencing a human genome is now about $1,000. It's been dropping faster than Moore's Law. There's not many technologies out there that can claim to be uh, 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 getting cheaper faster than Moore's Law. Um, and so today we're at an era where so many people can get their genome sequenced that the data sets are just becoming more and more exciting. So to date we've had about one and a half million people sequence their entire genome and far more people sequence parts of their genome, which means today more than any other day in history, the types of analyses and types of um, questions we can ask about genomes uh, has just become more and more interesting. So the types of problems in genomics and, and data science, there's too vast, too many to actually talk about in a, in a short talk, um, but there's so many interesting questions that are, are really um, at the forefront right now of science and industry. Things like evolution, how did we as human homo sapiens get to be where we are and why did some species evolve a different way? Uh, things like genome editing, you've heard this a lot in the news right now, which is can we change the genome a little bit to get a different outcome? Things like synthetic genomes, why do we need to use the genome that we were given? Maybe just make up a new one. Um, how do our genes interact with the environment? Do our genomes change over time and how does that lead to things like aging or cancer? Um, so I obviously don't have time to kind of go into all of these uh, different areas. But what I thought I would do is just kind of briefly talk about three different stories or three different ways data science is being used in genomics, just to give you a flavor of some of the kind of exciting work that's out there. Um, so I want to start with human traits, understanding our genome to understand how that makes us human and how it makes us different humans, how why some humans are tall and some humans are, are shorter, um, some humans are obese, some humans have diseases. And this is probably the most um, kind of well-known application of data science in genomics. Uh, and so kind of wanted to start there. So most of what we know about the human genome and how, about how um, the genome affects our traits is through studies that are called GWAS. So this stands for Genome-Wide Association Studies. Now what these data science, what these projects do essentially is they get two groups of people, two participants, a case and a control. So let's say you're interested in a particular disease, 
You find a bunch of participants that have that disease, you find a bunch of participants which don't, those are your controls, and then you measure the mutations in their genomes, and then you essentially count. You basically ask, okay, how many times at this position did I see a C nucleotide rather than a T, or how many times did I see an A in this other region rather than a G? Um, and so you count up and then you basically ask, is this mutation associated with, does it occur more frequently with, this disease than not? Now, of course, it's a little bit more complicated than just counting. I think probably the people in the field would be offended if I said it's just counting. There's a lot of actually very interesting data science questions of how do you do this correctly. Things like multiple hypothesis testing, um, things like making sure you're accounting for structure in the data set. So what if all of your case studies come from a single family? Well, then you might actually end up getting um, some incorrect results if you don't account for that. Um, but I'd say by far and large, this is kind of the most widely used application of data science in genomics. And, uh, and we've been doing a lot of them. So since the early 2000s or since the late 2000s, there was really not many areas in the human genome where we knew we could say, oh, I can point to this mutation and tell you how it affects the human being. But now, kind of the number of these studies has really ballooned. So there's about 20,000 regions of the human genome where we can say, oh, it's associated with this trait. And the number of participants, the number of human beings who have participated in these studies uh, is, is um, growing as well. So this is obviously very exciting if you've interacted with things like 23andMe and other kinds of um, uh, uh, apps that kind of tell you what your traits are based on your human genome. Uh, it's usually based on these types of studies, and they're very, very powerful. Um, but of course, they do have some amount of interpretation challenges. Because there's been so many studies done, um, because there's some of these complex issues of how to account for differences in the data sets, um, some, of the, uh, some of these associations are hard to understand or, or hard to really interpret. So for example here, this is one way of, um, of looking at these associations. On the left here you see chromosome 19, so it's one of our chromosomes kind of laid out end to end. And every kind of dot that you see there is a one mutation that was associated with a single SNP. Um, and you can see there's a lot. So if you kind of wanted to look at your chromosome 19, you could kind of look through all these mutations and see, okay, what kind of traits is it associated with? Um, some of them are associated with diseases, and that's going to be very useful for human health and understanding how to kind of um, uh, better improve patient care. Um, some of them are kind of for more complex human traits, like birth weight. We know birth weight can influence how, um, how a person grows up and can have an important health, um, uh, health uh, uh, consequences. Um, but, but some of these traits are a little harder to understand, and, and maybe we, we don't trust this as well. So how much does your genome really tell you about your mathematical ability? I think that's uh, a bit questionable, right? And so um, interpreting these, these GWAS studies has been, um, been a challenge. And one of the reasons for that challenge is comes back to this data set. What's the data set that we're using? Now, remarkably, most of these studies have been done with people whose ancestry is of European origin. So that's kind of the blue part of that pie chart there. Uh, where's everybody else on the planet? You know, this is not representative of human beings on this planet. Um, so for instance, Africans or Native Americans or people of Middle Eastern origins are not well represented in these studies. And so one of the major challenges to doing these studies right is being able to account for these types of differences, making sure our data sets are balanced and are really representative um, of humanity. And so uh, it's a very exciting field and, uh, and lots of very interesting scientific questions about how to do these studies correctly. And as the data continues to grow exponentially and re really exponentially, you saw those plots, it's not just a figure of speech, um, we have to think about how to kind of do these studies in a way that, um, uh, that, that avoid kind of bias and can actually have rigorous reproducible results. Okay, so the next kind of area I want to talk about is the 3D structure of the genome. This is probably a less popular topic of discussion, but I think is becoming more and more exciting and, and uh, more uh, applicable to understanding how, how our genome influences uh, cell regulation. So the human genome is very long. Uh, which you probably knew, it's about three billion letters long. And so if you were kind of take it out of your, your cell and kind of stretch it end to end, it would be about two meters long. But somehow that very, very long genome has to fit inside of a cell um, and actually inside of a nucleus, which is about six microns long. So that's six orders of magnitude that it has to kind of compact. And remarkably, we actually know very little about how the genome folds up inside these cells. Now, we know a little bit, right? We know it's not completely random. We know it's not a random walk. We know that there's some structure to how the genome folds. 
And we also know that it's not completely ordered, right? It's not like a, a nice kind of set of books all stacked up for you. We can just find the gene that you want in a nice spatially organized way. So somehow our genome folds up somewhere in the middle. Um, and it turns out it's actually a little bit difficult to figure out. You can't just look at it with a microscope because the size scales are just too small. And so what people have done in this field is develop uh, types of experiments that can probe the 3D structure of the genome using genomic sequencing. So one particular type of experiment that people use is something called Hi-C, um, and it and it's, again uses high throughput sequencing to look at the genome structure. And I won't talk too much about the experiment, but what that experiment produces, you basically sequence as much data as you can, and what you end up getting is what a, what's called a contact map, which tells you how frequent any two parts of the genome end up being next to each other inside, uh, inside of a nucleus when they're folded up. So for example, this here is a contact map for chromosome 8. It's laid kind of end to end here. Um, and you can see that it's not trivial, right? There's something interesting going on. There's some weird plaid pattern. Uh, and so there's, there's something interesting about how the genome folds up. Some parts of the genome like being with other parts of the genome, but they never like being with another part of that genome. Um, and so what people do, and this is a lot of the work that I did during my PhD, um, is take these types of data and try to infer, okay, what is the 3D structure given this type of data? And, uh, and you can start to do interesting things and understand why the genome folds up in different ways in different cells or in different people. Um, so for example, in genomics, it's thought that many genes require an enhancer, so another type of element in the genome in order to turn on. And so if the gene is very far away from this other element, it won't actually produce the protein of interest. But if it folds up, then you can suddenly get the protein being expressed. And so you can start to see how understanding what the 3D structure of the genome is influences what the cell is actually going to do. And this starts to shed light onto why different cells do different things in the body, right? Every cell in our, in our body has the exact same genome, but somehow our eye cell is doing something radically different from our heart cell, from our muscle cell, from a neuron. And one of the reasons for this is because the genome folds up differently in each of these types of cells. Um, and so there's kind of a, um, a wonderful kind of community and, and projects emerging trying to understand the 3D genome structure and how that influences uh, cell traits. Okay, so last, uh, last kind of vignette, I want to talk about applications of genomic science in infectious disease. So this is something that's more recently near and dear to my heart. Antibiotic resistance is probably a topic many of you have heard in the news. Um, it's a growing threat to global health. Every time we introduce a new antibiotic, like ciprofloxacin, an example of a fluoroquinolone, we see antibiotic resistance grow to that. Bacteria learn to be resistant to that drug. Um, and this is a problem, right? It's, it's thought that if current trends continue, there will be about 10 million deaths per year due to this problem. So um, one of the major issues with that is that it takes a long time to actually diagnose bacterial infections and figure out the right drug to give. So for example, in the case of severe infections like septic shock, a patient's risk of dying increases with every hour they don't get the right antibiotic. So if they don't get the right antibiotic by 24 hours, there's a 91 percent chance that they will have died. Unfortunately, our ability to figure out what drug to give the patient is extremely slow. So today, the way hospitals diagnose infections, it takes about a day to figure out what the species of an infection is, but it actually takes three to five days to figure out what the antibiotic resistance is of a pathogen and know, should I give the patient this drug or that drug? So you can imagine there's a kind of a big time scale difference here. A patient is kind of, their health is, is um, uh, deteriorating on the order of hours, but we actually can't tell them what drug to give them on the order uh, until a few days later. Um, so this is one of the things that our team is working on at Day Zero Diagnostics. Our mission is to diagnose bacterial infections on day zero, the same day a patient walks into the hospital. And to do that, we're using genomic data science. Um, so uh, so our, pro our um, technology works by taking a clinical sample, like a tube of blood from a patient, extracting the pathogen genome from that sample, sequencing it using high throughput sequencing technologies, and then analyzing those genomic sequences using modern machine learning methods in order to give a diagnostic result to the physician, basically to say, what's the species? Is it E. coli or is it Staph aureus? And then more importantly, what drugs should you give your patient? You don't have to wait five days anymore. Now we can tell you in five hours. 
Um, so one of the challenges to being able to do this is for any good machine learning algorithm, we need a large training data set. So this is a data set that doesn't exist so far. So one of the things that we've invested in is trying to build that data set, trying to gather as many clinical samples as we can of, of pathogens, sequencing their genomes, and then matching them with the labels, matching them to the antibiotic resistance profile of that pathogen. And the goal of our algorithm is when it sees a new genome sequence that it's never seen before, it tries to predict its antibiotic resistance and say it's resistant to ampicillin, but it's susceptible to ciprofloxacin. So, you know, give your patient ciprofloxacin. And like any good uh, machine learning algorithm, our algorithm gets better with the more data that we feed it. Um, and so our a AUC, area under the curve, which many of you have probably seen before, kind of goes up and to the right. And so we think about, okay, let's make sure we're getting our, giving our model enough data. But we can also think about places where, okay, if our model isn't performing that well, we can spend some time researching how should we make a better machine learning model in order to improve our, uh, our predictions. Another interesting thing that you can do with this data um, is look at hospital transmission events. Um, so it's an unfortunate fact that the United States, about 1 in 25 patients, goes to the hospital and actually gets infected while at the hospital. And these feel like a, a, a preventable source of infection, right? It's, it's kind of, there's the, um, you know, maybe it's a, there's an infection from another, inf another patient, from a healthcare worker, from a, a, an instrument. Um, and we would want to be able to prevent these and prevent outbreaks that happen in the hospital and prevent about near 100,000 deaths that happen per year due to hospital acquired infections. But unfortunately, bacteria don't just kind of raise up a flag and say, oh, hey, you know, I'm infecting this patient. By the way, you saw me three weeks ago in that other ward and uh, three months ago, um, you know, down the hall. And so uh, infection control units at hospitals don't have, a really, don't have a great way of being able to tell when an infection is spreading in a hospital. Um, so one of the things that you can do with bacterial genomics data is actually have extremely high resolution way of saying, oh, these two infections, they're actually highly related and you can stop hospital outbreaks before they spread by using, um, uh, by using genomics as an early detection system. So just kind of in conclusion, I want to kind of continue to evangelize what I think is a great opportunity. So if there are folks in the room who are in data science and trying to think of an application, I would say, Genomics is, an, is a great opportunity. There are so many different things happening, and I only think the opportunities are going to um, increase over time. So, uh, you know, I think it's, it's a great place to, to, um, uh, to work, uh, great projects to work on, and uh, happy to take any questions. Yeah, so this is something that we think about a lot. So in order to actually do a good job predicting antibiotic resistance from a genomic sequence, we want to make sure that we have uh, a data set that's representative of what we'd be doing in a clinic. Um, so we go to hospitals and we literally collect as many of their discarded samples that they have and we sequence those. And so we, we go to kind of a few hospitals in the area and um, kind of more broadly in order to get our data set. Um, yes, in the back. Well, let's, maybe let's wait for the mic because I'm having a hard time hearing. Yeah. And, um, privacy and security and uh, patients agreeing for those samples to be taken and how you sort of navigated that. Yeah, that's, that's a great question as well. So for the most part, bacteria, if they're on their own, the data that we get is just the genomic sequences of the bacteria and we don't get the information about the patient. So for example, when the patient was infected or what drugs was used on the patient. It's really just kind of just the bacteria itself, uh, which allows us to kind of collect that data. Um, but it's an interesting question, right, because th people have found that, for example, if you sample a microbiome of an individual, um, that's a unique print fingerprint. If you sample, for example, their gut and ask kind of what are all the bacteria that are in their gut, that kind of helps you identify uh, or that can be consistent over time and can help you identify a person. So it's kind of a new area in terms of uh, privacy. but. Um, in our case, we try to kind of not take any human data and just look at the bacteria themselves. Yep, yep in the back. Uh, let's, let's wait for the mic. Thank you for the presentation. Yeah. Um, in terms of genetic folding 
and packaging inside of the nucleus. Could you talk about what kind of machine learning models and what mathematical models he used to approximate the folding patterns? Yeah, yeah, I would say it's a it's a new field. Um, I mean, this type of data uh, has only been ex in existence for the past five years or so. Um, so I would say every kind of week there's new models coming out. Uh, and there's, uh, it, it's a hard problem. A lot of the, there's not a, an easy kind of take that data and go straight to a 3D genome structure. And so there's a lot of um, thought that has to be put into how to do that. So um, all sorts of, from deep learning to, um, to even very simple models to molecular modeling, um, I would say there's a very, very wide range of, of things that, are, that have been done. Hi, in the earlier slides, you um, brushed very lightly on genome mathematical ability. Can you talk a little bit about that? <laughs> yes, uh, <laughs> right. No, I mean, it's, it's very controversial. I think it's, and there have been many studies which have tried to associate intelligence, educational attainment, um, all sorts of traits which are kind of hard to wrap your head around. How much are they really associated with, uh, with the genome and, and the genomics versus how much are they environmental? Um, I would say it's, it's a hard problem and it's, it's uh, there are new papers coming out, I would say, every week that kind of discuss how much to rely on those types of associations versus how much you actually have to account for more of the bias in the data that wasn't uh, accounted for to begin with. So I think the jury is still out and, um, and I would also say a lot of these, um, a lot of these more complex traits, so, so there's some simple traits where it's kind of very clear there's a single mutation and that affects, um, that affects this kind of disease. And it can be very clear and we can understand the mechanism. We can see this is the gene, this is the protein, the protein is now broken, therefore the cell isn't functioning as it should be, therefore we get a disease. So those um, types of uh, cases where we understand the mechanism um, can be a lot easier to, to kind of understand. Um, but many of these other cases like mathematical ability or intelligence or educational attainment, there's not a single mutation that's found. It's usually many, many mutations that are kind of sprinkled around the whole genome across many genes, some of which don't seem like they should really have a very big effect, um, but maybe kind of an aggregate, each of them somehow contributes uh, to, um, to this larger trait. Um, but whether or not that is truly kind of causal and we can actually, if we were to, and I'm not definitely, definitely not advocating for this, but if we were to kind of edit a human genome in order to kind of make those changes, would that actually result in somebody who had that trait? Uh, again, the jury is still out on that. So very exciting time to be in genomic data science. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. In the front. Uh, I'm not super familiar with the... Hi. <laughs> I'm not super familiar with exactly how the uh, pathogen samples are actually collected, but I can imagine one potential um, issue that you might encounter with that is separating out what uh, sequences come from bacteria that are actually pathogenic versus um, bacteria that are just there, yeah. for example. And I'm kind of wondering, like, how do you address this without sort of looking at, like, the microbiome or having a panel of normal, like, normals bacteria? Um, just kind of addressing like, okay, what is the relevant information for my model? Because one could imagine that as a source of noise, is you have all of this other bacteria that just sort of lives on everyone. Right, yeah, no, that's, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, so I think in terms of, uh, I mean, I'll just separate, in terms of our data set that we're collecting, we, we can be very careful about that and we'll tell you kind of about that later, but in terms of the diagnostic, of course it could be that even in the blood or if you, uh, so for example, when you're sequencing, uh, when you're, collecting blood from a patient who is thought to have bacteria in their blood, you have to puncture the skin. And in puncturing the skin, you might somehow get some of the bacteria that live on the skin into your blood sample. So for example, Staph epi, Staphylococcus epidermidis, is a, a bug that lives on everybody's skin. And so it very frequently ends up in these blood samples. On the other hand, it also very frequently is a pathogen that's actually truly infecting the patient. And so not just for our diagnostic, but for any diagnostic, when you see this particular species, you have to ask yourself, is this a real pathogen or is this just kind of a, a contaminant that somehow is there and is not really causal? Um, and so one of the ways that people get around this, and um, not just for us, but kind of many diagnostics, is you sample multiple times, you sample multiple places, um, and you also have to have a physician who understands um, you know, kind of how to interpret these results. And so I think um, pairing uh, these types of diagnostics with a physician who has that knowledge will be useful in terms of uh, really understanding them.
within the patient population, one could imagine that um, at least for the antibiotics where we know the mechanism of action, like it inhibits a certain you know, pump uh, in the bacteria. Um, have you thought about doing this sort of like, I don't know, uh, analysis of the genomes themselves within the bacteria to see, oh, is this protein present and functional um, or this type of family of proteins? Um, Definitely. Yes, absolutely. I mean, there's a lot that we know about antibiotic resistance from genes and a lot we don't know. And so we um, kind of in doing machine learning, we try to kind of bridge the gap and try to combine those two. Cool. So. One more question? Uh, back there. Uh, so thanks for the presentation. Just wanted to uh, see whether you can give a little bit more details about the graphs that you showed, about your machine learning techniques that you're using for this. Are yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll briefly say that um, uh, basically what we do is we predict antibiotic resistance across a large range of both species and antibiotics. So for example, we think about methicillin, which is a type of antibiotic. We look at that resistance in Staphylococcus aureus. We also look at ampicillin resistance in E. coli. And so for each of these, we're building a model that tries to say, okay, when I see a genomic sequence, can I predict resistance to that antibiotic given the genomic sequence? And so um, some of the graphs that I was showing was basically as we get more and more data, we're able to do those predictions better and better, which is exactly what you want to see for a machine learning model. Um, and so we're kind of actively, actively developing some of these models and trying to improve them for some of the cases where they're not kind of up to snuff, um, and then kind of trying to use the ones that we have in production. Great. So, great. Thanks so much. <laughs>